The Canberrank season, you'll notice that we don't really have much wind. It's, it's generally quite calm this time of the year. It's one of the best times and it actually starts to warm up. Around us at the moment, there's lots of white flowering going on. So our peppermint tree, the wainer. At the start of the Canberrang, we know we're into it because we see the magpies swooping. So the magpies are courting in the end of the jilba season. And then when we get into the Canberrang, they're actually starting to lay eggs. Some of the little smaller ones, like our wrens, some of their babies have already come out. And so if we're walking through the bush, we see eggshells on the ground. The Jirigo is the really fluorescent blue wren. That little male is in full colour at the moment, and that's because he needs to attract females. Now, he might eventually attract five or six little females, and he thinks he is just the boss. Now, unbeknown to him, each of those little females is in courtship with another male as well. Generally, Camberang, I'm seeing lots of reptiles as well. I'm seeing a lot of bobtails, urine we call them. Uh, they're a family totem and you might start seeing two little bobtails together. They're courting, they're catching up with their partners. So it's everything that nature has been showing us and educating us for thousands and thousands of years. We are here today on Pippleman Country. It's also the home of the Pippleman people and the spirits of our Pippleman ancestors that are still roaming through this region as well. Welcome, and uh, I'm just going to pass on to Professor Hoffman now. Quick hand pass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry, and good morning, everyone. Um, I've worked on granite rocks for 40, 50 years now looking at plants, animals, trying to work out how to care for them. Uh, and for the best part of that, that time, ignored what I was walking past and on. My personal learning journey to do with granites started in the 70s when I was um, appointed as the state's first flora conservation research scientist in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in those days. I soon discovered that there were unusual concentrations of rare plant species on the uplands like granites. So I thought oh, I might as well work on these and explore as many as I can and better understand their flora. The plants and the animals that are on the rock, the oldest, uh, including some of the mosses and some of the invertebrates, go back 400 million years. The flowering plants are a more recent addition. So you're literally sitting on an evolutionary laboratory. It does look like it's a harsh area, but it's really very fragile, isn't it? That's well, it is. Learned. Yeah, that's, that's something we, we really don't know how to repair and restore these places yet. Larry, I'm no. really keen to get to work with students and elders to see, is it possible? Because, you know, these moss mats yeah. have very particular flora in the native flora. Yeah, but as yes. you can see, the blowfly grass and the flatweeds and other introduced things are taking over. One of the first things to be mindful of is when you're walking through, try and tiptoe on the bare rock, um, which isn't bare, it's covered in cyanobacteria, but bare enough, um, and avoid the moss mats as much as possible. And uh, certainly if there are tiny dwarf shrubs, don't walk on them because they're bonsai and they're likely to be decades, if not centuries old. A friend showed me in about 1996, I think it was, uh, a lizard trap on a granite rock north of the Fitzgerald River National Park. A lizard trap is a flat slab of rock that's propped up at one end with a stone and is very clearly a human construct, not something that would form naturally on, on granites. And um, that got me interested in Aboriginal people and I started wondering, well, how did Aboriginal people live with granites and use them and how important were they? We used to call them lizard traps. Uh, we changed that name. What we thought were lizard traps were actually lizard homes. We found out that um, we're actually farming these animals you know, for thousands and thousands of years. So, you know, the concept of farming in Australia before Europeans arrived here, well, we did. Uh, just in a way that, that worked in beautifully with, with, uh, with Mother Nature. Generally, the racehorse goanna was the most sought after. They taste really, really nice. They also have this beautiful oil or fat in their tail, 
which is really, really healthy for you and would go to the elders. So I've never eaten a tail before. I've always got the leg, which is still very nice as well. Our method of catching them would be with a club. Um, we weren't allowed to use spears on them because a spear is too easy. So we had these little clubs called towicks, which is just a little throwing club. And the idea is we actually had to get up close enough to that particular animal to use it. And if we missed out, well, that was too bad. So it was a way of leveling the playing field. Also tiger snake, I've eaten tiger snake before as well, the, the norn. Really, really nice to eat as well. Uh, very healthy for you. The bobtail, the urine, I've never eaten them, being a totem, but the tail is quite a delicacy. They store a lot of their fat in their tail apparently as well. I couldn't bring myself to eat those little ones. Yeah, well, they're cute. <laughs> One thing with granite is it gives you immediate signals if it's been disturbed because it doesn't have moss. And you can see that this has slipped down the hill about 10 centimetres. Right there is one of the prop stones that held it up as a lizard trap. So someone's come here and tried to lift it and it's slid, it slid down the hill a little bit and they've decided it's too heavy to take. The lizard traps were mined and made by Noongahas for generation after generation um, to create homes for reptiles and some of which were eaten. Um, but if you take them away and use them to make a garden wall or a footpath, uh, then in one small effort you've destroyed what could be tens of thousands of year old Aboriginal heritage. We were just having a little bit of a walk around just a little while ago and we actually found a pretty special little rock. It's oxided a bit now, so it's been in the elements for quite a while and it's dried out. Uh, but it's a red ochre, uh, which uh, down here we call this one midar. The red was only used by men. And it's been brought up here for ceremonial purposes. So we know that this was men's business right here. Mount Hallowell is a really important place. There are two places that are very uh, clearly sending signals that they're men's business. We'll look at one of them so that you too can recognise a men's business place. Can you see the signals to say, go no further if you're a lady? Ah, yeah, the phallic rocks. The phallic rock, so that big fella there, yeah. right? And capitate rocks, which are boulders like a head perched on top. Um, the elders I've uh, had a lot to do with say they're people frozen in stone for some transgression or, or as a warning. I certainly sense the men that were using this place over thousands and thousands of years. Pretty much as soon as we walked up here, this needs to be protected. It's an ancient place. We've just got to get the message out to as many people as possible that these are really powerful, uh, important places in Noongar culture, but important places for, for all West Australians. It's part of our broad cultural heritage now, I think, that the Noongars have gifted to us. And if we uh, continue to uh, use and abuse rather than sit quietly and reflect, then we're all the poorer for it.